Great, thank you, Brenda. I'm gonna get myself set up here. Hello, everybody. <clears throat> Excellent, I'm hoping that you can see my screen well. All right, <clears throat> so I will get started. Um, hello, my name is Andrea Nayosi, and I am an instructor at Kwantlen Polytechnic University. I'm speaking today from the unceded ancestral and current lands of the Musqueam people. In acknowledging these lands, I would also like to make a connection to my role as an educator and how education plays a vital role in our work towards decolonization, reconciliation, and restitution. The ongoing trauma experienced by Indigenous peoples across the land is the result of settler colonialism and the harm caused by residential schools for over a century. To quote Justice Murray Sinclair, education is what got us here and education is what will get us out. This project represents my own personal and professional journey towards acknowledging truths reconciling with our past and laying forth a better path forward. So thank you very much for joining me today. All right. <clears throat> so the OER trilogy that I'm gonna to present to you today is comprised of three separate publications. I've arranged this presentation to follow each journey separately, but to also show you how they all work together. I will be speaking about these three projects in terms of my process and my approach. For that reason, the presentation is divided into three parts, the, the creation, the curation, and the collaboration. And each of these headings reflects a different OER. <clears throat> so the three publications that I'm very excited to introduce you to are my consumer behavior open textbook. And then second project is the instructor ancillary resource guide. And this accompanies the textbook. And the third is my special piece of magic in this trilogy, which is the student anthology. So we begin with a look at the open textbook. This open textbook began in late 2018. I was inspired to create this book because I could see the inequities caused by the traditional publisher's textbook. Many of my students couldn't afford the book and those who could afford it were actually more likely to achieve higher standards in the course. The traditional textbook was also fraught with content that really bothered me and even my students. Stereotypes and a lot of irrelevant, outdated examples were used and those caused more questions and confusion than learning opportunities. The accompanying test bank was also poorly representative of my students and often contained gender or racial stereotypes. I even tweeted these out in a rant a few years ago because I was just shocked at how poorly written and worded these questions were. So I realized it was time for a change. In 2018, I applied and was awarded a grant from my institution, from Kwantlen, to get this project off the ground. In 2019, I participated in the UNESCO Open Education for a Better World Mentoring Program, which also motivated me to complete a large portion of my work by the summer of 2019, so I could present it at the conference in Slovenia. I continued working on this textbook as much as I could while teaching full time. And in early 2020, I was awarded a grant from BC campus to complete the book, which I did just over a year later. And then it was published this past summer. I should add that completing this book was part of BC campus's initiative to have zero textbook costs resources in marketing undergraduate programs. And I was really happy to be able to contribute to that. So 
There are a few things that make this book stand out from other tradi traditional textbooks on the subject of consumer behavior. And consumer behavior largely borrows from psychology, sociology, anthropology, as well as business and media and communications, advertising. Going into this project, it was my intent to do the very best I could to decenter whiteness and dominant culture perspectives. I really wanted my students to see themselves in the stories, the examples, and the content so they could relate better to the materials. Additionally, incorporating social and environmental justice themes was really important, especially when talking about topics related to consumer decision making, consumption, and consumer capitalism. I have a mantra in this course when I'm teaching it. And I really want to reinforce that marketing is not a right, it is a privilege. And for those of us who are doing marketing and, and perhaps even business in general, we have a responsibility to do our work without causing or perpetuating harm. So one of the features I'm most excited and proud of is the amount of student created content within the textbook itself. So open pedagogy has been a cornerstone to building this textbook. And I believe the opportunity for students to learn from their peers has made the content more relevant and useful. So what makes this book stand apart from the others in addition to being open licensed and free? While the content has been intentionally targeted towards addressing the erasure of traditional knowledge systems. So some examples, we examine how Maslow appropriated the Blackfoot way of life model that informed his hierarchy of needs. There's probably not a business course or textbook anywhere that doesn't talk about Maslow, but very few actually talk about where he learned and was informed in order to conduct his research and create his models. We also look at topics that aren't traditionally shown in many textbooks or marketing courses. For example, how cognitive biases created fear and uncertainty for consumers around consuming food containing MSGs. But this of course was only targeted at Chinese food restaurants. Maybe this is something some of you remember growing up with. I certainly do remember seeing signs all over Chinese food restaurants about their food not containing MSG. But of course, none of this sort of marketing was ever applied to Western food such as potato chips or french fries. One of the book's content creators or content contributors also provided a critical overview of the real psychological damage caused by Indigenous mascots and why this particular form of racism in sports exasperates inequalities and fuels racial injustice, particularly for school-aged children where racist Indigenous mascots are part of a sporting program. We also examine in the book how consumers are manipulated through cause-related marketing campaigns, particularly around environmental greenwashing, as well as the rise of pinkwashing, which can often be associated with marketing campaigns related to breast cancer fundraising. And finally, we journey to the world of TikTok users and K-pop fans uh, to learn about how collaborative work by teenage brand communities can join forces to intentionally sabotage a particular US presidential's quest for adoration in the form of political rallies. Hopefully this is relevant and interesting to our students today. The infusion of social and environmental justice themes come in the form of the Sustainable Development Goals. This textbook is an open educational resource connects to SDG number four. Within the content of the book itself, I've prioritized establishing equitable representation, the best of my ability, while pulling back the curtain on how marketing can perpetuate inequalities within different consumer groups and subgroups. We also look at how marketing should be held responsible for designing strategies that fulfill responsible consumption, production, and even product disposal at the end of the product life cycle. So these four SDGs have been a critical part of building the content in the book. 
Now, open pedagogy practices have, of course, played a central role in developing some of the content for this textbook. Students have contributed to shaping the book through annotated learning, by authoring content themselves, and by creating interactive and engaging teachable content for future learners. In the early days of developing the textbook, my students had the opportunity to write and publish op-eds that were built using persuasive writing techniques, which of course linked to our course concepts. And they used these to tell real life stories, marketing situations, and provide cases and essays on things that were relevant to them. In addition, students have had the opportunity to create projects where they could build teachable content that future students could learn from. So many of these projects were actually developed using H5P, which of course is a very well-suited tool, tool for an open textbook developed in Pressbooks. These projects featured contextualized examples of our course concepts developed through the eyes of today's learners. So these two examples here show a timeline of fast fashion and its implication and impact on the environment. And as well, a timeline of all the different kinds of world cultural events that have really shaped Gen Z through marketing. Really neat topics. So a few tips and takeaways, of course. In my experience creating this first textbook, it was long and daunting process. I'm not going to pretend that it was an easy one that I could just juggle along with full-time teaching load. In the early days of putting together the structure and the content, students were still having to use the publisher textbook. However, I did my best to take advantage of the situation so that we could leverage this publisher's textbook to help build an open resource for the course later on. And students were incredibly cooperative and supportive of this work. So this included finding new ways that students could infuse the textbook with updated and relevant examples. They helped me identify the gaps, tell the stories that needed to be told, and address some of the really starking examples of stereotypes and misrepresentation or under and over representation as well. Okay, so here we are, part two now, the curation side of things. The second part of our trilogy moves into the creation, the curation part of our story. The Instructor Ancillary Resource Guide was created out of an abundance of content that I had assembled for the open textbook. It's strange, I know. And perhaps this guide came out of my own lack of focus, very likely, and procrastination, definitely for completing the actual textbook, but whatever the case may be, I did find that I was in a situation where I had enough content for BC campus to generously extend to me another grant to have me finish this instructor resource book. And I also used part of my initial grant from Kwantlen to finance some of the content contributors who are featured in this instructor ancillary resource book as well. I discovered that this book would be the perfect home for my KPU SDG Open Pedagogy Fellowship Renewable Assignment Project. And this is something I worked on last year with two outstanding colleagues from Maricopa College and Montgomery Community College. The Ancillary Resource Guide is comprised of a collection of essays and case studies mostly contributed by other writers that also have reflective questions that could be used for class discussions or turned into assignments. In addition, there are assignments and project outlines that I have used in teaching this course for many, many years that could be adapted in different ways for an instructor teaching either consumer behavior or probably a similar course in marketing or in business. Some of these assignments even includes samples of students' work that's been created in previous years. So instructors could get an idea of what some of these projects might look like. 
The essays and case studies all connect back to the concepts and themes from the open textbook. And many of these themes are related to the intent of the book, as I mentioned earlier, to decenter whiteness and dominant culture perspectives. So some examples. One of the essays we have here contributed by Martin Heavy Head, who is a Blackfoot member, talks about whitewashing, toxic masculinity and colonial myths. We also have essays that address gender stereotyping and advertising. And we even take a look at today's brand communities that many learners can probably relate to, such as sneakerheads. And finally, we continue to explore themes around sacralization, stereotyping, and we use these to juxtapose some of the examples of cause-related marketing that we see in the book, this time from a positive and productive perspective. The collection of assignment and project outlines in the book offer a variety of ways that the instructor could interact with the textbook. So for example, there are outlines provided for scaffolding, peer reviews, and persuasive writing into developing a full op-ed as seen in the book written by some of my previous students. Annotating learning using hypothesis as well as creating teachable content in H5P. These are all projects that I've carried out with students and those outlines are contained in this book. In addition, there are opportunities for students to perform self-reflection and to go a little bit deeper into the themes of social and environmental justice by examining the SDGs. These are some fantastic examples of some of the teachable content that my students have created using H5P. These are great, they're renewable, they are engaging, they're interactive, and they're relevant to today's learners. These were all created using H5P's image with hotspots. And they're fun examples. For example, we have one here that looks at the meaning of color across different cultures. And this could be expanded and built upon in future classes. We have another example that um, compares boomers versus zoomers in the consumer decision-making process for buying a car. And then we have this really neat example looking at a hypothetical basketball player and looking at this persona in terms of their, their self-concepts and their lifestyle and how that informs their consumer decision-making. KPU's SDG Open Pedagogy Fellowship Program is a very innovative and collaborative way for faculty across different institutions to develop renewable assignments centered around one or more of the SDGs. I had the pleasure of working with an art history instructor and a mathematics instructor from our partner institutes. And the three of us designed a collaborative multidisciplinary renewable assignment that features cultural and data literacy. This assignment can be adapted for different disciplines and it provides students an opportunity to explore the SDGs through different lenses. I've included this open licensed assignment in the resource guide as well. All right, so some tips and takeaways again. I honestly can't think of a better companion piece to a textbook than an instructor resource guide. Hence, I call it the BFF. I found this to be a really great opportunity to bring together assignments and projects that I've done in the past, as well as those I still do today that have helped me guide through the creation of the open textbook. I also found this part of the project to be exhilarating because it gave me a chance to work and collaborate with scholars, academics, colleagues, indigenous leaders, and a lot of really amazing people to bring important stories to the surface. Finally, we have now come to the last installment of my trilogy. This final publication, which is still a work in progress, is a collaborative piece designed specifically for students. This is a student-created OER that focuses on the stories and experiences of my students and what they've gone through as living as 
consumers during a pandemic. The content in this book is based on concepts and themes from our open textbook, but it's all expressed through self-reflection in a variety of creative formats. I am collecting the content this year. I hope to apply and be successful in getting a grant next year to um, undergo some editing and accessibility work on the book, and then hoping to publish this next year as well. The student anthology has been presented to my students over my summer terms this past summer and the fall term right now as an optional final assessment in our course. So students can choose either to do a final exam or they can join me on this publishing journey. They are given the choice to develop and express their work in whatever format they prefer. So we have essays, infographics, even videos. And I collaborate with students to help them develop their work so that it is suitable for publishing. And as it turns out, students have a lot of fascinating experiences as consumers during the pandemic, as I'm sure we all do. They have shared what it's been like to adopt a pet and become a new pet owner during the pandemic, how the coronavirus has changed their digital experiences as online gamers. They've explored social norms, persuasion, sensation, and the significant changes to our sensory marketing environments due to things like lockdown, social distancing, masking, and even an increase in online consumerism. One student, and I kid you not, even created a 45 minute documentary film that looks at the Asian experience during the pandemic, the rise of anti-Asian racism, and how the pandemic has shaped his family and friends' experiences as consumers in Canada. He's created this all through interviews. I really wanted to include some testimonies from students. So with their permission, I've added these to the presentation. Ravi writes, I have found that it was a lot of fun for me writing a student anthology compared to doing a final exam, as I found it put less stress for me, thus leading to more flexibility. Furthermore, I was astonished when there was an alternative between a student anthology and final exam, as most of the previous professors I've had in the past have never offered an option between a final project and final exam. In this way, I have found that I was able to demonstrate my knowledge further, which can lead to other students learning about the work I have created. Ina wrote, the student anthology is a great way for us to understand the concepts and overall material in the course. By taking the content and using real life examples, we develop a better understanding of the material. Creating this content for future students is a way to share your own perspectives that can be relatable to other students in ways they may not have thought of on their own. By doing a final exam, it can create a lot of stress, panic, and trying to memorize all the material rather than understanding the concepts. By doing the student anthology, I realize that it has made me a better student and will keep the material solidified in my memory for the long term. And Evan shared, working on the student anthology allowed me to be invested in my work because it lasts and other people can benefit from it. Memorizing and then forgetting answers to questions on an exam is stressful and doesn't necessarily show an understanding of material. I chose to do the anthology to ensure that future students understand the real world experience that we had during the pandemic and how the course topics applied to that experience. It allowed me to be creative and personal in my answers instead of reading an outdated case study. As a student, doing projects such as this makes learning enjoyable and fulfilling. Wow, <laughs> wise, wise words. <laughs> so a few final tips and takeaways. 
Out of all three parts of this trilogy, <clears throat> I have to say this final piece feels magical to me. My best advice in working with students on such an ambitious project is to prepare, plan ahead, and build in enough time to help them develop work that reflects their vision. This also presents an excellent opportunity to introduce students to the world of open licensing, using open license tools, and even legacy building. And finally, to quote myself, because I've said this at several, I've said it several times at different conferences, and I've seen this quote circling around in different places, but I truly believe that unconventional assignments call for unconventional grading. And none of this would be possible if I had not embraced aspects of ungrading and put more trust into students already. So these are my three pieces that make up the anthology. This concludes my story. It all started with an open textbook that needed to right the wrongs of past marketing textbooks. It overflowed due to an abundance of work and a very restless mind, as well as a desire to see the open textbook adopted by more instructors through the creation of an ancillary resource guide. And then to cap things off, giving my students the opportunity to share their experiences and to create a resource for future students seemed like the perfect fit for this trio. Links are provided in my presentation, and I hope you've had a chance to find the PDF of the presentation. It's been uploaded along with this script, and you can have a look at some of these resources and perhaps even share them with any colleagues who you might think will benefit from them. And this is my OER trilogy. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you've enjoyed this. Now, I'm not sure if there's any questions or anything that I can answer for anybody. <laughs> Hi, can I ask a question? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, so I teach in a business program also, and I just like, I don't know if I wasn't hearing part of this, but I'm curious like over how much time and how many classes did you create these materials? It just seems, feels like so ambitious. I, I, I'm really inspired by it, but I'm also like, oh, how much time, like, you know, so I'm just curious if you could, if you could elaborate on that a little bit. Well, I started the open textbook in 2018 and I published it this summer. So a few years, but that was in addition to teaching full time. So during my non-teaching term, I would dedicate as much time as I could to pulling curating all the open content and then filling the gaps and working with content contributors. So, um, and then I did have a grant from BC campus, which I used as a time release from some of my teaching loads. So I could continue to dig in. Um, and then the uh, ancillary resource guide just kind of happened, as I said, through this abundance of work, essays and case studies that I had collected. So I, it gave me a chance to kind of separate and divide those two. So that project itself didn't take us long. I have a test bank for it as well um, that will be published any day now. I just have to get it to Melody, <laughs> get it to BC campus. And then the student anthology, this final piece, um, I'm just, I've been doing that over the summer and this fall with my students. So it is a, it is a big project. It's taken me several years to work on this. And I don't necessarily think that everyone has to do all of these pieces. I think that there's a way to sort of carve out your own space amongst all of these. I don't know if that helps. Yes, that super helps. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm happy to help more. <laughs> uh, so I see Sharon, you have a question here regarding the grants. Did you use the funds to pay students or staff to help with creating the book or did you use it for course release? So a combination of both. Sharon, uh, BC Campus, their grant 
was for course release. And then KPU's grant was um, what I paid content contributors, which um, one of those is in the textbook and the remaining ones are all in the ancillary resource guide. So I would work with them to co-write or edit um, the case studies and essays. And even one content contributor just had this really like awesome Twitter thread. And I was like, oh, can I pay you to, so I can rewrite that <laughs> as an essay? She's like, sure. <laughs> and so I, I did that and that, um, that formed the whole basis of the content around indigenous mascots. So it kind of got sent out into different areas, which was so helpful. Um, I'm trying to just scan the chat here for other questions. If I've, you can even just add them at the very um, end, copy and paste them at the bottom if I'm missing anything. Well, thanks for all the encouraging comments, everyone. I really appreciate it. Um, you're welcome to contact me if you have any follow-up questions. And uh, as I mentioned, the PDF provides links. So you can always um, click on the links to actually access the books in um, BC campus in their collections. And then the student anthology is just a work in progress sitting in press books right now. Are there any other questions before we end the session? Looks like there's lots of really flattering comments in the, <laughs> in, the con in the comments there for you, Andrea. Um, <laughs> so, you. oh, we do have another couple more questions. Um, yeah, how did the H5P projects get organized? Um, I'm not sure what you mean specifically about organized, but um, I have a project outline that invites students to create teachable content so that we would actually use the publisher's textbook uh, while we were still using it a couple of years ago. And I would invite them to, you know, take any sort of model concept theory within the book and say, how, you know, how could you teach this to other students who could relate to it? And so students, I didn't, I spend a class teaching them H5P and say, if you want to do H5P, here's how to do H5P. Um, if you don't want to use it, you don't have to. But a lot of students love trying out new tools. So, um, so they created these projects in H5P. Some of them are included in the textbook. And then um, some of them are in the ancillary resource guide as, um, as examples. Part of the challenge with the H5P, of course, is at the time, I, it had not occurred to me to build in accessibility and ensure that they were accessible. So for this reason, including them in the textbook wasn't a good idea because um, it would have required redoing the projects to make them accessible. And BC Campus, of course, has um, extremely high and important standards around accessibility and that needed to be honored. So I had to just parse those out a little bit. You're welcome. Well, it looks like, you know, people are just sort of you know, taking it all in. And so I want to uh, say thank you, Andrea. This was a really great session. Um, and we are able to leave, um, continue the discussion if you want, or we can stop the recording right now because it looks like people are sort of just a little overwhelmed. So um, all what I'll do is I will stop the recording right now. And uh, if you want to continue the conversation, we can do that. Sounds good.